Hello to everybody. Thomas, perhaps shortly you will introduce yourself and uh, the, the, your title is The Prison of Rationality and How to Liberate Ourselves from Its Right. That's right. Thank you, Elif. Well, my name is Thomas Walter, and I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of Melbourne. I'm also a trustee of VARS, and I have a number of other hats, but I won't uh, uh, bore you with that. Instead, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about something much more interesting, and that is the human imagination, which I see as a mental faculty equal to reason, but different and complementary. And this is not just an opinion, but it's something I'm, I'm going to try and, and uh, uh, show how, how exactly that works, how the, where the imagination actually arises. Um, now, there's few scholars in the Western tradition who've actually paid attention to the imagination. I've written a little bit about it in the past, and I've been inspired by my work in Indonesia. Another one is... Uh, though Henry Corbin, who's quite well known, and he is always um, reminded us of a self-imposed poverty in our present civilization. And I quote him, Western philosophy, drawn along in the wake of the positive sciences, has long admitted only two sources of knowledge. Their sense perception, which gives us the data we call empirical, and they are the concepts of understanding the world of the rational laws governing those empirical data. But as Corbin further notes, there is also active imagination, and I quote, which has its own noetic and cognitive function, which gives us access to a region and a reality of being, which without that function remains closed and forbidden to us, and whose disappearance brings on a catastrophe of the spirit. Corbin's active uh, imagination is reminiscent somewhat of the Im imaginatio vera or true imagination in the work of Paracelsus and also to the Vedanta notion of kalpana or creative imagination which is seen as the world creating faculty of the mind or mana kalpita jagat. In this paper I ask how are we to understand this second mental function in scientific terms how does imagination arise and how does it relate to the current late modernist malaise in science and education? Now I regard image, image formation or the forming of images, mental images as the foundation of all subjective experience and consciousness in animals and of course, most of all in humans. And I would like to argue that there are three kinds of images, those of the past, those of the seeming present, which is really the very recent past, because there's a delay between perception and image formation. And finally, those not off but for the future. In other words, I see normal consciousness ultimately as a bi-directional engagement with time. This is a rather strange assertion, I must admit, but let me explain why image formation is vital for the everyday subjective experience of change. Now, Combin's uh, inspiration was Persian philosophy, and he saw active imagination as a mediator between reason and the senses. I see it somewhat differently. I see the connection with reason, but I don't think um, um, the idea of a mediating function really captures what imagination does. And to clarify the role of imagination, I'd like to draw your attention to, to some very basic mechanisms of consciousness, which emerged rather early, um, many hundreds of millions of uh, years ago in the evolution of life. Now, the three classes of images I mentioned, past, present, and future, correspond to memory-based reason, sensation, and imagination and all three are vital cognitive functions. There were some uh, behavioral researchers, Alan Baddeley and Graham Hitch, who were the first to propose that uh, consciousness is based on, on working memory. That was in the 70s, and they were inspired by Vygotsky's idea of internalized speech. They were hoping to understand what we actually do with mem memory in the now and how that relates to consciousness. 
uh, and they built on earlier work by two physiologists, Holst and Middlestead, who had the vital, vital research findings to explain this. The latter had made an important discovery about how animals perceive change or motion in the environment, which is something that animals must do to stay alive, irrespective of whether they're hunters or hunted. They found that animals continue continuously create a multi-sensory mental image of what is happening now. They store that image in working memory briefly and then compare it with the next image created from what is perceived in the next now. Uh, animals thus create an internal loop through the past with the help of a continuous imaging function designed to detect change over time yeah, by comparing those images. And change means it could be a predator coming, it could be some prey that uh, might be of interest and so on. And by extension, certainly in humans, this imaging process also allows for the rational post hoc analysis of, this, of causal relationships between events. The word image is somewhat biased, I should mention, because uh, there are, of course, also auditory and olfactory elements that flow into this imaging process. Now, together, the imaging techniques of conscious beings are called afferent copy mechanisms. And the mechanisms concerned with storing observations of the outside world and thus creating a loop through the past is called ex afferescence. You could say that ex afferescence is what gives us the impression of a passage of time and also something to operate our reason upon. Now that's all very nice, but not so surprising. Our memory of the past, of course, helps us notice when something new appears, a new sight, sound, or smell. This is a process that resonates strongly with the basic operations of science. New empirical observations are evaluated against an earlier model of reality and the model is adjusted or updated. This is basically the way we teach the scientific method. The much overlooked and intriguing matter, however, is that the two physiologists found a second looping process, which they call pre-efferescence. In perception, a second problem arise. While what an animal does may depend on what it sees, the image an animal sees in turn depends on what the animal does. For example, if we, it moves its head, the image of the world will change, even though nothing has moved in the environment. Therefore, even simple animals evolved so-called reafference mechanisms to predict what image they should perceive in future as a result of their own action, so that this imagined image can be compared what is, with what is actually observed by the senses. Action would be utterly impossible to monitor and control without the second loop. Think of hand-eye coordination in catching a ball, for example. If there is a motion in the environment, it can thus be detected reliably, even though the animal is in motion itself, because the potentially confounding effect of the subject's own action have been compensated for by creating this loop through the future. Now, as far as I can tell, the significance of this mechanism has been left somewhat unexplored. Just as ex afferents evolved into higher memory-based rational function, for the postdoc analysis or observations, reafference evolved into a higher imaginal function, allowing animals not just to monitor action from moment to moment, but also to plan by contemplating the various futures their different action sequences could create. All the more curious then is that contemporary humanities should be so unable to imagine a positive, desirable future and to act accordingly in the present if the actions we're actually taking lead to suicidal and ecocidal outcomes, why do we persist? Why are we so powerless to change? And I argue it is because we, are, we have failed to do justice to this second and complementary imaginal subject, subjectivist function of the mind, which has a crippling effect. Um, and this is repeated in each generation as children are taught in a modernist system of education that has this rationalist objectivist bias and cannot see the importance of imagination. Uh, so for the sake of simplicity, we can think of those two afferents operations 
uh, at the physiological level as in terms of uh, sensory ex uh, mental experience as imaging and imagining. Imaging of, is about the past and imagining about the future. And these cognitive functions are rational and imaginal. All experience that we image and store of the objective past, whereas imagining is about creating virtual images that are not observations, but a continuous inner broadcast of projected future states reflecting the expected impact of the subject's own action. Modernist rational science has seriously serious trouble accommodating, accommodating the imaginal function within its objectivist worldview. The consequences are devastating. And unfortunately, the causes are also deeply entrenched, not least within a flawed modernist system of education. That must change. It shouldn't be that the most creative people we have, uh, uh, people like Einstein, like Tesla, were often eccentric, dreamers, misfits, people full of imaginations. They're not, they didn't get where they got by education, but they are survivors of education. It shouldn't have to be like that. To conclude, our senses may be great at telling us what is out there and equally within our body. Reason is created at analyzing post hoc how elements of the world relate, the order of things, reality as it is. But it is imagination that helps us picture and choose between different futures. Reason remains tied to what is, the truth, perhaps, which lies in the past by the time we grasp it. But the exclusive worship of reason has led us into an entra entrapment within a kind of hyper-realism, hyper in the sense that this world of images we inhabit is also a world, is, is really just a world that is created, or in the in the words of the Tabula Smaragdinas, sicut mundus creatus est. That's something we should remember that the worlds, that even the worlds of the past are worlds that have been created. Imagination needs to be reinstated and properly understood as a faculty of higher order thinking par excellence. There's some truth perhaps in the biblical claim that we humans were created in the image, so to speak. For indeed, it is the nature of the human mind to be a, in a world of images. But we are not just knowers of images, we are also image creators. Imagination enables us to recognize ourselves as moral subjects, as creators, as makers of images and of new worlds. Imagination is indeed the vital force that makes conscious action and moral action possible. It is so fundamental that it defines us and in its simplest forms is present in all sentient life. We not, do not need to learn to imagine. What learners need is opportunity to develop their imagination, to share it with others and to, Im and to imagine shared futures together within conscious communities of moral actors. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Thomas. Very intellectual, so well-designed, philosophical <laughs> presentation. So uh, as Einstein said, logic may take us from point A to B, but imaginations can take us wherever we want. So yes. thank you so much for your presentation. I would like to pass quickly to the second presenter. Shesh, could you please uh, give your presentation, share your presentation with us? So what I am going to be trying to do is to present a set of ideas that I believe have to become the basis for education, not only of formal institutions, academic and otherwise, but informal, public, and academia. So let me begin. Okay. There is general agreement among scholars that humans are now in what is defined as the Anthropocene best described in the Encyclopedia of Earth as follows. The Anthropocene defines Earth's most recent geological time period as being human influenced or anthropogenic based on overwhelming global evidence that atmospheric, 
geologic, hydrologic, and other earth system processes are now altered by humans. The word combines the root anthropo, meaning human, with the root scene, the standard suffix for epoch in geologic time. The Anthropocene is distinguished as a new period, either after or within the Holocene, the current epoch, which began approximately 10,000 years ago with the end of the last glacial period. The Anthropocene is a starting point in terms of major revolution, in terms of humans moving away from being hunter-gatherers to farming and agriculture, and for all intents and purposes, the onset of evolution of what can be described as civilization and societies, inclusive of varieties of politics, economics, religion, and culture based on philosophies, concepts, and ideas, or what might be best described as operant paradigms. These operant paradigms can be traced to human attempts to understand, define, and act on three major relationships namely humans and divinity, humans and nature, and humans vis-a-vis -vis humans. Civilizations, Eastern and Western, have in a broad sense operated on two such paradigms or philosophies, describing the nature of the three relationships named above. The first one, namely the polytheistic Eastern, which predates the monotheistic Western by millennia, is based on the idea that humans and the divine are inseparable. Humans are part and parcel of nature, inextricably connected and interdependent, and all life, including human life, is one and the same, as opposed to the ideas of Western civilization that postulates that humans and the divine are wholly separate. God has given humans dominion over nature to understand and use for human progress and human life is sanctity personified over and above all other life. Both of these paradigms are operating to this day, even though the Eastern paradigm is steadily receding into the background, even as recent realizations seem to be forcing humans to reconsider returning to it, notwithstanding the fact that the Western paradigm has now emerged as the dominant one over the last two millennia. A major difference in these two paradigms is that the Eastern paradigm pursued knowledge for knowledge's sake and in the process obtained profound understandings of the external world, but was primarily preoccupied with knowing the inner human self based on inner directed explorations to obtain release from the human condition as in moksha or nirvana. The Western paradigm moved forward within the framework of what is best described as the Baconian method, directed at the external world, thus obtaining discoveries and inventions to apply and use for human progress, progress deemed to be limitless, based on understanding and exploiting nature for meeting human material needs. An important distinction needs to be made with respect to the inherent nature of the two paradigms. The distinction is with respect to the scope and extent of human agency. I'd like us to keep in mind this word, human agency, in obtaining desired outcomes and futures. Implied in the Western paradigm is the assumption that human agency, as ordained by the divine, is the sole determinant of desired outcomes and futures. The Eastern paradigm, on the other hand, while not eliminating human agency, is much more fatalistic and demands human agency be used within the framework of broader ideas and values described above. Given this background, it will now be appropriate to assess the state of the planet and the general condition of humans on it, and more important to examine whether the idea of human agency as the sole determinant of desired outcomes and futures is valid and sustainable. The dominant paradigm operating for the last two millennia based on human agency as the sole determinant of desired outcomes has developed and implemented a plethora of ideas to create utopia. While it is important to acknowledge that the accomplishments are fantastic by way of improving the material condition of humans, uneven as it is, it would be fair to expect 
that utopia would have manifested long ago. Needless to say, however, anyone looking dispassionately at the human condition and the state of the planet today, one would have to conclude that utopia is nowhere near to being achieved. And actually, in many respects, we are confronted with the stark reality of dystopia and unintended consequences. Human populations have burgeoned from hundreds of millions to billions. Poverty, disease, pandemics, war, destruction of the natural world, extinction of species, climate change, impending exhaustion of natural resources, etc., is there for all to see. It is at this critical juncture, it is imperative, therefore, that we take a second look at how the future comes about. In order to get such an understanding, it is necessary to first attempt to describe a model that will best illustrate the process in action that causes the future to come about. The following is an attempt to outline the framework of a model that more closely approximates the logical structure of the real world. The model can be described as follows. It is a three-dimensional matrix. The first axis is humans as participants, individually and collectively, concurrently functioning as agents at eight different levels of identity, continuously attempting to optimize their multiple interests, namely individual, family, neighborhood, city, state, region, nation, the planet. The second axis is the world around them in the natural realm, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the zoosphere, the atmosphere, space and beyond all in a constant state of flux, naturally and otherwise. The third axis is the varieties of systems that humans have initiated and have then evolved into the current forms, social, economic, political, religious, cultural, at all. Similarly, in a state of constant flux. This complex three-dimensional matrix, mathematically speaking, equates to a mind-bogglingly huge number of dynamic interactions taking place sequentially and simultaneously every second, every minute, every hour, every day, and so on. Humans as agents between themselves, interacting with elements of the second and third dimensions, similarly interactions within and between the elements of the second and third dimension, all resulting in outcomes and consequences that one can reasonably argue would be beyond any currently known means of managing towards a desired outcome and destroys the smug and misplaced notion of humans managing and obtaining desired outcomes and futures. The evidence to support this conclusion abounds all around us. Scholars around the world are suggesting that humans are at a critical juncture as to their future, and, and that survival of the species is at risk if course corrections are not taken. As it relates to course corrections, recent scholarship has given rise to ideas and concepts that enable a better understanding of how the future comes about, human agency notwithstanding. A complete and comprehensive presentation is beyond the scope of this paper, but a list of them with brief definitions is valid and required. First, the idea that the earth is being or Gaia, the Gaia hypothesis, also known as the Gaia theory, Gaia paradigm or the Gaia principle, proposes that living organisms interact with their inorganic surroundings on earth to form a synergistic and self-regulating complex system that helps to maintain and perpetuate the conditions for life on the planet. I would refer to the work of Dr. James Lovelock, who introduced the notion of Gaia. There are seven principles underlying all life. One, the principle of abstraction. There is something intangible behind the life in physical bodies, indeed behind all matter, and that the immateriality is revealed by the flow of time, which literally makes things into events. All forms of this mysterious no meaning is abstraction. The principle of interrelatedness, which geneticists tells us, is a measurable fact among all members of a species, including humanity in all its races, and on deeper investigation, turns out to apply as well to whole kingdoms of creatures, 
not to mention interrelations between kingdom and kingdom or between world and world without end. The principle of omniscience of life, which denies that an impervious boundary has ever been found between any of the kingdoms or for that matter between life and non-life, which leads to the inescapable conclusion that all rocks and seas and worlds and consequently the entire universe must in sense be alive. The polarity principle, which recognizes the balance and mutuality of the opposites that we see everywhere, things like light and darkness, good and evil, male and female, predator and prey, matter and energy, all of which by their contrast, give definition to life and make it work. The principle of transcendence, which refers to the development of our perspective on time and space as we grow older, as well as the progressive absorption of all self into a wider awareness as one matures spiritually. The, the germination of worlds, a critical event that seems to happen once to every celestial organism and after billions of our billions of years of slow evolution. The greatest mystery of all, the ultimate mystery of divinity or whatever you choose to call the unknowable essence that leading thinkers have long believed somehow exists beyond creation and maintenance of all body, mind and spirit, not to mention behind every other known or unknown wonder of the universe. The future, therefore, as I would put it, is an emergence based on the description of the complex model given above. It would be easy to see that the future emerges out of the interaction with human inputs as active walkers. Some processes that are inherent in the emergence are the elements of complexity, the tipping points, catastrophes, self-organization, and so on. Let me quickly, briefly describe each of these, and then I will conclude. Complexity, simply defined as the study of the phenomena which emerge from a collection of interacting objects. Complexity characterizes the behavior of a system or model whose components interact in multiple ways and follow local rules, meaning there is no reasonable higher instruction to define the various possible interactions. The term is generally used to characterize something with many parts, where those parts interact with each other in multiple ways, culminating in a higher order of emergence greater than the sum of its parts. Catastrophes. The catastrophes occur when, as we move in a continuous way through the family of parameters, usually by smoothly changing a stable fixed point of the family, loses its stability. This change of stability forces the system to move abruptly to the region of a new stable fixed point. The butterfly effect, which we all already know about. The butterfly effect is the sensitive dependence on initial conditions in which a small change in one state of a deterministic nonlinear system can result in large differences in a later state. Tipping point, the critical point in a situation, process or system beyond which a significant and often unstoppable effect or change takes place. And probably the most important, self-organizing systems. Self-organization, also called spontaneous order, is a process where some form of overall order from local interaction between parts of an initially disordered system. The process can be spontaneous when sufficient energy is available, not needing control by an external agent. All this that I have presented basically is to point out that we overstate the idea of human agency as the sole determinant of outcomes. Students, academic and otherwise, must and be made aware of the fact that the future, at least as far as I think about it, is an emergence out of a complex interplay of multiple factors that I have just described. So what it means basically is a human agency must play the role of enlightened self-interest as a component, as an input to the system, which can then create an outcome that we would have desired. The idea that you can create futures in a top-down fashion 
in a short term, four year, five year, 10 year basis is a fool's errand. Thank you. Okay, okay dear Sesh, thank you so much. Uh, yes, we are surrounded with complex systems and interdependencies, interconnectedness, and etc. And as you said, enlightening experience experience is of vital for our higher education. So thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, Zipnik will have 15 minutes as well. The floor is yours, dear Zipnik. Could you please turn on your microphone? Thank you very much, uh, um, Elif. I'm happy to see you, uh, everybody. And I would prefer we are sitting in the same room. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my presentation uh, is about a uh, question which I knew the answer for years, for, for sure, uh, that higher ed education is an important contribution. But last years, and particularly during this uh, crisis, I started doubting about that. Uh, about all education, whether uh, the current education is good enough to meet the current challenges. Let me move to the agenda. So there are high expectations uh, of this conference. I guess we are moving toward the end. And then I would like to talk briefly and then mention some of the challenges. And then uh, as the response, I would like to propose a type of educational kit, a type of system uh, to educate new generation to, to survive in, uh, with all these challenges. And uh, then I will have some conclusions. Please, uh, with uh, Thomas' uh, presentation, emphasizing the, uh, the, the imagination, how important is imagination to resolve current problem and that build sustainable future. I'm also uh, pleased with uh, Shesh uh, uh, system approach. In fact, you know, this is what he uh, suggested. I just uh, finished the uh, panel discussion uh, on the previous session and we agreed that we need to have a system approach. And uh, I suggested also to use a system analysis as a meta language, you know, for different disciplines, because we have, we, we need to find the, the common language, you know, to build bridges between different disciplines in academia, if you want to, to uh, move to trans social transformation into sustainability and to share knowledge and uh, experience. Uh, then uh, uh, the issue is, uh, we emphasize uh, in the previous session and at the same time uh, I see here, we need to have a common ground, uh, a value set we agreed upon uh, and then uh, to add that to any quantitative or qualitative sustainability criteria. And then uh, we as educators, uh, uh, we need to apply uh, results uh, of our dialogue, uh, what will come out from this conference to learning process we are conducting to prepare the next generation to emerging uh, challenges. Well, there are many challenges. I just mentioned uh, some of you, um, climate change, uh, biodiversity decline, and then through information overload uh, with fake news. Uh, we are still fighting. Uh, and uh, I don't see the end of COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, I barely survived this year, by the way, so I am happy to be with you. Uh, uh, invigorated, you know, but still a long way to, to fully recover. And then we have uh, very dangerous uh, uh, processes with growing populism, nationalism, uh, xenophobia, leading to, to, to leading to conflict and wars. Uh, talking about uh, images, you know, I am waking up during the night, I see 
the children and families uh, push up through the border between Belarus and Poland, you know, by uh, inhuman uh, administrators, inhuman government on both sides. I'm talking about not only about Belarus, but also on the Polish government. They push back uh, without any human concern and then cut off of media to avoid imagining, to build our imagination to understand what's going on. So political systems are very important and then uh, our education uh, might be not succeeded uh, uh, if we will leave this issue aside. So we have huge uh, gaps between rich and poor and uh, also we have many uh, new technologies and some of them are helpful, but sometimes we are losing uh, control. What uh, our colleagues in academia are uh, telling us uh, that 21st century is the uh, continuing uh, and rapid changes, uh, uh, but uh, where change is the constant uh, feature, constant feature of our reality, you know. So somehow uh, we need to be aware and then we need to prepare this is a big responsibility for us. But also both COVID pandemic and uh, climate crisis call us uh, to act fast and uh, to design effective uh, uh, access to save global community. Are we prepared for this? I suggested, you know, that uh, based on uh, the sources I studied in my 53 years in academia to develop a type of toolkit for students to survive and prosper. And first starting with the designing uh, learning process as discovery of new knowledge and looking for uh, innovative solution to emerging problems. The next element is to teach and practice critical and system thinking through practical case solving, practicing peer-to-peer -peer training and, and uh, using endogenous uh, knowledge and asking challenging questions to learn about uh, discern the illeg legitimate information or to learn how to avoid and uh, discard uh, fake news or manipulated news. The critical uh, and another element is building social competences uh, from community, uh, from communication skills to be working in uh, transdisciplinary teams in resolving uh, practical problems. The other issue is uh, to, to need to prepare our students to work with stakeholders, to be open for uh, stakeholders to understand their needs and to respond to them with new skills and uh, knowledge. And then uh, if we build already uh, human capital and social capital. I understand as economists, I'm very sorry if you are disturbed by my economic language, uh, but uh, uh, I am economist. Uh, uh, but social capital, I mean, uh, mean uh, relation uh, capital, all this interdependence, uh, uh, the relations with other human being is the social capital. And we need to create that type of capital, which is celebrating a successful solution, uh, solution for community problems. So I, I heavily utilize the partnership for 21st century, combining with my experience. And uh, what is important and, and particularly missing very often uh, in the current activities is the evidence-based education of policy and practice. And this is something what they promote and innovative teaching and learning for all. 
when I see the practice of uh, Polish government uh, dealing with uh, 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 COVID-19, uh, uh, it's a politically uh, goals approach, not evidence-based. They ignore evidence-based data provided by experts. So how we can survive in such uh, um, a system? And uh, what is important, uh, if we need to uh, focus not only on uh, science, but to make global awareness and uh, uh, teach them civic literacy and also health literacy to, and environmental to survive. And then uh, let's move to conclusions. So in general, I see that uh, uh, um, the knowledge, the education could be a great contribution. What is important uh, to give them skills of good communication because the even best knowledge will not uh, be practical if we don't know how to use it. And then apply it in life, uh, real life, problems and then this way we should shape student sensitivity passion and empathy what i am observing now this is something and this is what gives us the working with uh, community uh, stakeholders because we understand the problem we try to support them and developing passion and empathy. This is something what we are missing, uh, the emotional elements in our education. So anyway, uh, and then education is a critical foundation for social transformation. But if we do not combine it with stakeholders, particularly if we do not have influence on on the government, if we do not have democratic system, if we have centralized system, well, we might have well-designed education process, uh, but we will uh, lose the opportunity to contribute to uh, uh, social um, uh, transformation, to desire social transformation for sustainability. So anyway, uh, this is something what we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, besides academia, uh, besides uh, education world, there are other stakeholders who not necessarily uh, are focusing on sustainability or uh, human well-being. They want to uh, extend or sustain their rulings and they do not uh, uh, support that type of uh, education we were talking uh, we were talking today uh, in our presentation so anyway with this is something what uh, uh, we need to uh, work together on common language we need to uh, together uh, with different uh, discipline to find uh, the uh, common language and develop the solution uh, to avoid deterioration of basic human rights, values, natural resources, and degradation and wars. This is something what is the current world with all these uh, uh, um, demands and challenging around. And uh, so we need to learn how to work together and take advantage of emerging technologies which sometimes could be very useful, but sometimes could be dangerous and making us, us more dependent and even enslaved. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, I'd be delighted to respond to questions. Thank you so much, Zipnik. We enjoyed this presentation a lot. You underlined the importance of 21st century skills like global awareness, critical thinking, health literacy, different literacies, and uh, inclusion of uh, stakeholders and uh, learning how we, can, how we can equip students with resilience. And uh, we need to add long-term vision 
So learning conflict management skills and etc. So you underlined very important things. Uh, thank you so much. Now I would like to uh, ask all of the pre uh, presenters. Uh, do you want to add extra things or give some feedback? So I can start with Thomas, then can go with Sesh and then with Sydney. So please, uh, Thomas. Yeah, first of all, I just wanted to note that I think there was quite a bit of overlap between my paper and Shesha's paper. That's very interesting. I think your, your concept of these three domains, I think it's, it's very vital. And uh, in anthropology, we speak of human ecology. So that's the way a society as a whole, uh, on the basis of its culture, its history, its politics and everything, interacts with the environment. It's our way with the environment and yes. human ecologists differ and it's interesting how how long human beings have lived quite harmoniously with their ecosystems maybe causing some damage all uh, all uh, uh, species do cause some impact but within you know reasonable limits and it's really only the last 200 years that things have gone of that exactly. past, that long established past. It's the, the onset thing I of the to... Baconian paradigm that yeah, has yeah. Changed, changed everything. That's right. And it's modernism. And it's that same, yes. that's why I'm critiquing modernism. It's left the imagination out. And it, it's all about facts. You know, science is all about facts. And it doesn't guide us about the future we want to create. It tells us what is, but not what could be. Yes. And that's because the imagination has been written off as fantasy. Uh, I just wanted to say that I remember very distinctly when I was four years old and uh, I had, uh, I was li living in a city, mixed groups, children, ages playing together. And I realized with, with shock, you know, the impact that school had on my playmates. They could no longer play. I thought that school was this terrible place <laughs> where horrible things were done to children. And, and when I went to school, I went there like one goes to a war zone because I felt that whatever this place was, it, it had a terrible impact on people's imagination, you know. And, and uh, I think my, my fears were justified. And I kind of lived through education like a lot of people who, you know, who are have a strong imagination, creative people struggle with that system. I see a lot, a lot of boys I see also struggling with it, the disciplinary, oppressive act as side of it. And uh, it's really uh, PhD students at that final level, suddenly it turns around. Then, you know, you're supposed to be creative, break new crown, do something completely unexpected and wonderful. And how they're supposed to do it. I've had so many conversations with my PhD students. I had to give them kind of a therapy to, mm. to encourage them, to, to find, you know, to let them find the courage again to use their imagination. I think that's yeah. terrible and something has to happen there. Well, and it's uh, that bloody mindedness of modernity that, that does it, you know. Anyway. Yeah. So okay. uh, based on what uh, Thomas just said, I have a couple of comments and then maybe add to something that uh, Zygniew pointed out. Uh, one is he was talking about critical thinking. Mm -hmm. I think there are, as I understand it, there are four basic errors that happen in how we think or based mm -hmm. on information. One is, insufficient information, two is incorrect information, and three is bias, and four is prejudice. Yeah. Bias and prejudice are kind of interconnected, yeah. but to give you an example of insufficient information, average is used as a number all over the place. But if you do not know the deviation around the average, you will not understand what's going on. The height of people on the planet can be stated to be an average of five foot four inches. It is totally useless information 
unless you know what is the variation around that average, just to give you an example. But on the other, now, as to populism, nationalism, fundamentalism, and so on, I have kind of fashioned a notion that we are undergoing three or four major transformations globally, which cannot be understood in decadal or even generational timeframes. The first, first transition, as I describe it, is between knowledge and scientific systems vis-a-vis -vis faith and belief. Basically, mm -hmm. what I'm pointing out is that over millennia, knowledge and acquisition of information about the world around us intersects what we have been told is being truth from the very beginning. And that intersection has created the tension between the increasing uh, return to fundamentalism because vested interests do not want to give up their power, influence, and control. But I have a feeling, though, that knowledge around about us, around us, and about ourselves will eventually overcome the whole idea of truth being a given from the very beginning. The second transition is what I would describe as the revolution that took place in 1954 with the discovery of the DNA molecule. Basically, mm. till even now, it is continuing, which is the knowledge acquired about the external world. But in 1954, the, the discovery of the DNA molecule pointed us towards understanding who we are and knowing that we are not very far away from chimpanzees or for that matter, that we are vital dust from the stars, according to a Nobel laureate Christian de Duve, that is a transition that is revolutionary in terms of understanding who we are. It shatters the notion of self and humans as being the most important. The third one, transition-wise, as I see it in a global millennial sense, is the idea of the nation state being overcome by the notion of globalization. Yeah. So in terms of nationalism, in terms of populism, in terms of the return to the identities of the nation state and other ideas is because it's a reaction to being yeah. powerless to yeah. cope with the idea of globalization. Yeah. And the yeah. fourth, and the fourth, and the, and the fourth, let me quickly, and the fourth transition has to do in a very general sense about human societies intersecting as it relates to collectivism versus individualism. Yeah. Basically, the notion that individualism is supreme importance, where only rights are emphasized and no obligations, is the devastation that we are seeing around us. Yeah. Okay, at, uh, we need to, I think, uh, finish at uh, 4.50. So, dear Zipnik, uh, you, you have time because we can uh, use three more minutes, uh, but the next session will start at 6.50. Sorry, 4, 4.50. So, Zipnik, please share your feedbacks or ideas, extra additions with us. Thank you uh, uh, for, for for your comments. I, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah, that uh, uh, this is the uh, the problems uh, we have with this nationalistic tribe approach coming from fear of globalization, of fast cha technological changes, and all yes. these conspiracy theories and uh, the simplest way of explaining the complexity. So the complexity is hard to bear for, for <laughs> even educated people, you know, like it is, it we is. are in academia. And this yes. is really tough. What about mm. the simple people? So uh, this is something what, uh, what is important uh, uh, for us. Uh, but uh, uh, I still hope that... Uh, we will overcome that type of uh, uh, difficulties 
by reforming education, by open them that we are part of uh, a global community. We need to start thinking, you know, freedom is great, but uh, the, the same uh, liberty I have uh, equals my responsibility. So there is no freedom without responsibility, period. This is how we should teach. And this is some, how, when we are talking about education, we should keep, you know, not in mind, not only knowledge and skills, but also shaping attitudes, shaping citizenship. And we should global. move citizenship, you know, to the global citizenship. So we are working locally, resolving local problems, but uh, we should think, keep this in the global context with how they uh, support. This is why I, I, I was thinking about uh, to put some uh, things uh, uh, in a type of toolkit and, uh, you know, working on the recovery after COVID, I was thinking, you know, mm. okay, if I will survive, what I should do, you know, I mean, first of all, be useful. And this is something what I learned mm. from my grandfather, uh, who was substitute uh, to my father, who I lost as a, a little child. He was always telling, you know, we should be useful for mm. our family, for our community. Mm. Uh, not, don't think just about yourself, but about your use, uh, useness, you know, your uh, contribution to the community. So anyway, this is something what uh, we need to teach open mind, new generation, and in general, what I would like to, to, to share with you also, it was conclusion from, from the other session, but also I observed, you know, working with uh, young people at the university. Uh, young generation is ahead of us in terms of thinking, you know, globally, and uh, much more sensitive to those uh, issues we, we used to, to live for years and uh, did not discover. So anyway, get involved all stakeholders, young and old, and then uh, work for our common future. Thank you. I would like to thank all of you. I benefited a lot. I'm sure all attendees uh, enjoyed this uh, session. Thank you so much uh, to all of you.